last time I stood here, I preached a sermon entitled Forbidden. And when Penny asked me several weeks ago um, what my sermon title would be for today, I had just finished watching a political debate on TV. <laughs> and rather impulsively, I responded, let's call it the fear factor. <laughs> Forbidden, the fear factor. That's a lot of F words. <laughs> Today we will explore the contours of fear, a very common human experience, and yet hard to talk about. And we will do this together as spiritual community. Would you be with me in just a moment of prayer? God, may the anxieties on our hearts and our minds be known to and held by you. Amen. Well, what can we say about fear and the role that it plays in our lives? I know I could talk about a time when my 15-year-old self charged right into my fears. It was a day at a Sonoma beach I was there with some friends and these lock, large rock formations, some of you may know what I'm talking about, along the coast were beckoning to us, spontaneously, without appropriate gear. We began to climb. And as we climbed, we encountered this large gap in the rock formation. It was probably 60 feet, 60, 70 feet below the swirling ocean. And the only way across this would be to jump. Well, everyone wanted to turn back. As fear rose within me, hot and heart pounding, sort of like I feel right now, <laughs> so did this manic determination to dominate that fear. So I jumped. I was lucky. I landed with just a few scratches. I could also tell you that the only, only one other person followed me, just happened to be the only other boy in the group, because in those days, boys couldn't let themselves be outdone by girls. All the others turned back. I could tell you, about the rescue helicopter that circled a few hours later because the grown-ups became worried. We'd been out of sight for such a long time. We were safe, but how would they know? I could tell you that it took me a long time to realize that my response to fear in that moment, my attempt to be big and bad and charge into my fear, did not generate less anxiety in the world. Instead, it generated more. Maybe you could tell me about a time when you charged into your fears. In the arc of the story, according to John, at the time of today's reading, Jesus knows his life is short. In fact, the next few chapters are often called the farewell discourse. Perhaps at that moment, he is running full speed with world-changing purpose into his greatest fears. And to prepare, he is sharing a communion table with his friends, the beginning of a tradition that we will celebrate today. His followers have many questions about the future. What if, they ask, what if they come after us? What if I can't make a living for my family? What if? And according to the story at this point, Jesus knows that some will hide, one will deny, one will betray, and some will run. 
I wonder if you have a story about running away from fear. I know that I could talk about a time when my 32-year-old self went to the hospital because I thought I was having a heart attack. My chest was so tight, the pain was severe, I was sweating, I couldn't catch my breath, and after stress tests and blood tests, I found out that my physical heart is just fine. But because of my brain's chemistry, my spiritual emotional heart was not. I could talk about learning to hide those panic attacks before I learned how to cope with them. Thank you therapy, meditation, and medical intervention. I could tell you how many irrational, yet very convincing fears have trapped me into a running posture for many years before I would allow them to catch up and tag me. As I look back, I think sometimes I was playing freeze tag with those fears. Because when they did catch me and tagged me, I froze. Maybe some of you know what I'm talking about. However, I'd rather tell you about how Jesus responds to his friends' fears. He uses the words in the English translation, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe. As many great spiritual leaders before and after, Jesus says, let me paint a vision for you, a potential, a possibility to hold in your mind as you navigate through fearful, troubled times. He uses the words, in my father's house, or we could say, in my parents' house. In the ancient Jewish mind and the patriarchal system, this would have been more like a conception of family or household rather than a building. In the CCSM, CCSM's context, we might say beloved community. In this beloved community, there are many dwelling places. Not one, but many. In the vision, the beloved community is not just for you or for me or for our respective tribes. There are many dwelling places. If only we, the whole human race, or we could narrow it a little bit and say, if only we, the people of these United States, had all the same fears. How much easier it might be then to occupy one dwelling place. But we don't, do we? Our fears are different because our experiences are different. Perhaps even our realities are different. So in the political debate that I mentioned earlier, as I watched what was taking place, I was overtaken by the presence of fear. Are you with me? The whole stage and the whole room, the audience, just felt like it was smothering in it. On the stage, the engagement was not rational, it was emotional. People did not want to hear rational strategic plans for public policy. They wanted to see their candidate intimidate and bully all the others. With impunity. And though we could probably nuance the degree in which bullying tactics are employed between various candidates, I think we could conclu conclude that the intimidation and bullying is not a one-sided phenomenon. It happens on both sides, the red and the blue. Why? <clears throat> what about calling others into the ring for a fighting match appeals to us? How did our engagement become jabs and punches, projections of self-preservation through violence, 
whether it's verbal or physical, rather than receptivity. Through receiving wholeheartedly, open-mindedly another's viewpoint. I think it may be because we are all terrified. It was uncomfortable to sit with that just a little bit. We are terrified. I cannot recall one conversation that I've had about politics, probably for at least the past year, that did not include words like scary, I see some heads, afraid, terrifying, move to Canada. <laughs> What happens when we swim in fear? We operate from the very base part of ourselves. And when we see someone speak out loud our biggest worries and then promise to forcibly address those worries without regard to anyone else's worries, there's relief to our anxiety. Even if it's just for a little while and even for a very short period of time. According to multiple analysts, and the one I'm quoting is Derek Thompson, and you might have figured out I'm, the sermon has something to do with the fact that we are going to the polls in a couple of days. Derek Thompson of The Atlantic says, history has drawn an economic crisis overseen by America's first black president into a crucible. Some of us are living in an, in, an, in an America where economic anxieties and racial ethnic anxieties are nearly inextricable. He goes on to describe what he calls the twilight of white America. Economic anxieties, racial ethnic anxieties, nearly inextricable. In short, Thompson says, scarcity triggers tribalism. Despite the long decline in racism among most American voters, prejudice is blooming where voters are most pessimistic and afraid. Economic anxiety and racial anxiety are not separate forces, but rather a growing, snarling hydra. And we can just look at history to see how this has happened again and again. We can hear these fears on the rhetoric on the national stage. And since fear makes great media, we hear the fears, we see the fears, we read the fears again and again. In our own community, here in San Mateo, San Mateo these same fears play out in the debate on housing solutions on immigration, on education. Here, where the median income is one of the highest in California and in the nation, we struggle with who is allowed in and who is kept out. How do we define we? That's the big question. Who is we and who is they? Those are the building blocks of politics and of community. What do we mean by beloved community? And in answering those questions, as uncomfortable as it is for me to say this, I think it is safe to say that fear is a factor. The question is, what do we do about it? As people of faith, what do we bring to this conversation? Those of us, and there may be a few of us out here, who live with anxiety at heightened levels, we know that when our hackles are up, even a teddy bear can appear like a monster. And we also know that the least helpful thing when feeling anxious is to hear from someone else that our fears are not warranted, 
allowed or valid. So here's the thing, and I don't expect this to be popular. Frankly, what I'm about to say is the part of being Christian that I dislike the most. So I welcome your disagreement when we connect after the service. <laughs> and I may be the only one needing this message, but I wonder if we might in some way find the capacity in whatever way we feel strong enough with God's help to just listen. to be truly open to the expressions of those who seem diametrically opposed to our own ideologies and, and methodologies. Even if we're not listening to the difference in issues, can we listen to the fear? Can we hear the fear? The fear within our conversation partners and within ourselves. Can we refrain from the punching and jabbing instead with an open, honest conversation? Can we propose a sincere request? Please tell me, what makes you afraid? I want to know what worries you the most. We don't probably have to go too far to have this conversation. I know that we often hear that the Bay Area is a bubble. Well, it's a bubble with a lot of different kinds of people in it. My guess is we could find people to listen to right here at CCSM who have very different views from our own. And you know, I think it is in this meeting ground that I believe we might actually find the hope of our common humanity. There's not one person, or animal for that matter, on the planet who does not know the shadow of fear. And wherever you stand on any issue facing our nation and the world today, you might describe yourself as afraid. I wonder if in listening to one another's fear, we might begin to see with more wisdom more compassion, and more sympathy. You know, whether our preferred approach is charging right into our fears or running away from it or freezing in our tracks, I hope that we keep the faith. I think faith might be described as walking with fear and hope together. See, tomorrow begins yesterday, and the present moment is really all we have to work with. And if we've chosen to follow the teachings of Jesus, we have this vision of tomorrow as a time, space of beloved community out there somewhere waiting for us. I don't think the, term, the terms beloved or community connote uniformity. Quite the contrary. Do not let your hearts be troubled, for in my Father's house are many dwelling places. We are not expected to reside all under the same ideological roof. Just to be neighborly, just to be open-hearted in conversation with one another. On Tuesday, I wish there were two stickers at polling places everywhere. One that says, I voted, and another one that says, I listened to someone who voted differently. Amen.